Christine, can you make me a co-host? Good morning, we're, we're letting a few more people in. Um, we'll give it another minute. I think we'll take one more minute because uh, it looks like there's some people getting in. Okay. I think we should get started. My name is Katie Lacey. I'm with the Massachusetts Housing Partnership, and I'm here to welcome you to day three of the housing in the Gateway Cities Housing Institute. Um, and we have a small group, so I'm hoping there's time for lots of discussion. Um, our first session, I'm really looking forward to. Um, it's unlocking potential with local tools for housing. And we're going to have three speakers to talk about, um, you know, just really specific tools that, that communities can get done to actually build stuff and in, in, um, to address the affordable housing crisis um, rather than looking at it globally. So we have Austin Hodge, who's the senior advocacy specialist for AARP Massachusetts, you may be aware that AARP has been a leading advocate for um, accessory dwelling units. Derek Thomas, who's the founder of Incremental Developers, one of the um, sort of groundbreaking developers of ADUs in Massachusetts. And finally, Hannah Carrillo, legislative liaison with the Somerville Mayor's Office, who's going to talk about some other tools that the city of Somerville has been working on to curb displacement and protect lower income housing households in the city. So with this group, I think we can get started. And I think our first speaker is, is Austin. All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm just gonna get my PowerPoint presentation up here, hopefully. All right. Everybody see that all right? Great. Well, good morning. Um, as Katie said, my name is Austin Hodge. I'm a senior advocacy specialist for AARP Massachusetts, working out of our office in Boston. And I'm going to be talking a little bit today about accessory dwelling units and how they can, uh, how AARP can help with the development of them uh, in your towns and communities. 
Um, so I just want to start off with a little bit about accessory dwelling units. I imagine most of the folks on this call know what an accessory dwelling unit is, but just in case you don't, um, it's an in-law unit uh, or a guest house, caretaker quarters. They're a second smaller home or dwelling within the main house. Uh, they can be separate or attached, but usually have the kitchen, bathroom, separate living area, and a different mode of egress, whether it's a separate outside entrance or shared entryway. Um, there's a lot of different ways to build ADUs. They can be detached or attached as a home expansion, built into an attic or a basement, as we often see, or you can convert a garage or carriage house into an accessory dwelling unit um, for someone else to live in. And there's a wide variety of reasons people build ADUs. Uh, a big one uh, is that empty nesters can build one and rent it out or rent out the main house for income. Um, particularly as uh, housing prices increase, property taxes increase, and we see increasing displacement um, in our cities and towns, ADUs can give people a source of income that lets them retain ownership of the home. Families with kids can build one for grandparents, you can build one for a caregiver, for an adult child with disabilities, or as I mentioned, use them as supplemental income, or just a place for uh, the kids to live with a little more <laughs> independence. Um, AARP represents people 50 and older, um, and we have over 775,000 members here in Massachusetts. And so we do a lot of work understanding what people 50 and older want and how they feel about housing. Um, and what I want to underline on this slide is just that the majority of people believe that they will remain in their home or community. Um, Almost 50%, 46% of people we surveyed think that they will stay in the home they are in now for the rest of their life and never move. People think that that is where they will be. Another 13% say that they might move into another residence within their current community. And what we hear from people, uh, I'm sure most of you on this call have heard of aging in place, um, but what we hear from people so often is that they want to stay near where they are. They want to stay in the faith community that they're in with the friends and family members who might be nearby. They want to go to the same shops and restaurants. Uh, they have you know, roots in a community that they want to maintain as they grow older and maybe need a little more help or some financial assistance. About 50% of the people in our survey said they would consider or already are sharing their home, um, but um, a majority would consider it if they needed help with everyday activities like chores, transportation, or other needs. Um, and that brings us to accessory dwelling units. Um, people are, will consider building an ADU for their home, particularly if they have a loved one who needs care. Um, you know, we represent people 50 and older. So while that does represent people on the older age of the spectrum who may need care or uh, have limited mobility, we also represent people in their 50s and 60s who are taking care of kids while also looking after their aging parents. Um, and so the ma majority of uh, respondents we hear from who want to build an ADU, that's why. It's to bring parents in to live with them, um, maybe to help care for children or just to give them a place to live independently while still remaining close to home. Um, and while in our survey about a third of people would consider building an ADU on their property, only about 7% actually have one. Um, and we're, we're not sure what the exact number is in Massachusetts, that's a, a national number. But given the restrictions on accessory dwelling units here in the Commonwealth, it, it could be lower than that. So. Uh, AARP has been working to try and increase ADU production here in Massachusetts and around the country. Um, we supported Governor Baker's housing choice legislation that I think, again, many of you on the call are already familiar with, um, that passed as part of the economic development bill uh, this January, um, which put some changes in place that make it easier to amend local ordinances to allow for ADU construction, either by by right or special permit. Uh, so that it requires just a simple 50% majority instead of a two-thirds supermajority in order to change some of those bylaws. There's still local restrictions that can be put in place, um, and ADUs have to meet certain definitions in order to qualify, including being 900 square feet or half the size of the principal residence, whichever is smaller. Um, but the state has a lot of resources on you know, what needs to do, what you need to do in order to make a local ordinance change qualify. Um, for this reduced uh, majority. AARP has a model local ordinance um, and model state act for that matter 
um, for ADUs, um, which I encourage folks to check out. I'll have a full address uh, later in the presentation, but this is something that AARP did with the American Planning Association back in the year 2000, and we've recently done an update to um, with their assistance, the assistance of a number of other um, organizations, Smart Growth and, and others in the space, um, looking at a lot of case studies from the past 20 years for cities and towns who tried to make ADU changes, looking at what worked and what didn't when it come, came to really spurring production of these units, which uh, provide a lot of benefits, particularly for older folks in the community. So um, I won't go into too much detail on that today. I'm happy to answer questions, but it covers some poison pills um, that we've identified that in other places have really hindered development, um, like owner occupancy requirements that require that both the, the unit, the ADU and the main house be owner occupied, parking requirements, conditional use permitting, you know, requiring that a, an ADU only be legal when it's there for your, your mom and then you have to tear it out once there's no longer a family member living in it. Um, and it covers a number of other things like application review standards, the whole short-term rental issue like Airbnb, uh, building code reforms and ways to incentivize ADU construction or incentivize certain types of ADUs over others on the local level. Um, all of this is available along with our livable communities um, resources, which I hope uh, some of you on the call have already heard of. If you haven't, um, AARP's Livable Communities Program, our age-friendly communities program as it's sometimes called, um, is looking to support communities around the Commonwealth um, to think differently about housing, transportation, public space, uh, when it comes to making all of our communities great places for people of all ages. Um, you know, we offer a lot of resources on our website. We do, a, we have our Community Challenge Grant Program where we give out grants to communities around the Commonwealth every year for some of these sorts of projects. And we have a lot of tools, including our livability index. Um, we have a weekly e-newsletter that if you'd like to get on, I can give you more information on that, um, as well as a lot of published resources. Um, some of these are specific to ADUs, which is what I've been talking about. Um, there are some, uh, I'll give the address here, aarp.org slash ADU. If you'd like to see our ABCs of ADUs guide, which I'd really recommend, it goes into much more detail than I'll be able to about ADUs um, and some of the benefits that they can provide, as well as examples of different cities and towns that have promoted their development. Um, we also have information on you know, zoning, commercial zoning, streetscapes. Um, there's a lot of stuff, including our handbook for improved neighborhoods at aarp.org slash zoning. Um, and all of it can be found along with other things on public spaces and parks and placemaking uh, at aarp.org slash livable communities. And these are all free resources. They're provided um, to people like you who want to make improvements to their cities and towns. So we really encourage folks to check it out um, and look at these resources and, and give us a call, shoot us an email. Um, yeah, that's that's my little plug here. I think we'll do questions at the end uh, before, uh, but I just want to put my email there at the end, Austin Hodge, a hodge at aarp.org. Um, because you know, if you're working here in the Commonwealth on ADUs or other livability issues, uh, AARP is here to help and we want to be a resource to folks. So uh, Katie, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Um, I do have one quick question, Austin, before sure. we um, given that you're working in sort of a national space, uh, I know you you focus on Massachusetts. How is Massachusetts doing in terms of ADUs relative to other states? We, we're hopeful about, how's that? Uh, we're hopeful about the future. The housing choice legislation that I mentioned, you know, that really just went into effect at the beginning of this year. And we're hopeful that cities and towns will take that and run with it to make the changes that are required to allow for more ADU development. What we've seen in Massachusetts is that there are a lot of cities and towns that allow ADUs in theory, but in practice license or give permit to almost none of them because there are a lot of really crazy requirements in place that hinder development. Um, you know, I, I've got a list somewhere of all the requirements in different cities and towns. And you know, some places you can't build an ADU if your house is built after 1932. Some you can only build it if the house is from before 1989. Some places you have to have a 3,000 square foot lot. At some places you have to be you know 25% over the minimum lot size. Um, you know, we're working with 
Dedham, Massachusetts, where they have a requirement, I think, that you have to be 10% larger than the minimum lot size. And almost 70% of the homes in town are grandfathered into zoning and don't even meet the minimum. So, mm. you know, only 15% of the homes in the town would qualify in the first place. So we're, we're hoping to see movement with cities and towns getting rid of some of those restrictions in order to encourage development. Because right now, um, it, it's functionally illegal in a lot of the state. Thank you. I'm not, I'm not surprised by your answer at all. Um, so useful. Thank you so much. And those are great resources. So let's move on now to Derek Thomas. Uh, and we can see his slides. Hey, Derek. Hey, how are you? Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Um, I can't see my slides. So. Let's see, Christine maybe has it. There it is. <clears throat> Austin, that was great also. I was just taking notes on um, how to put on an online PowerPoint presentation on Zoom because that's the way to do it. I don't think mine's <laughs> gonna be that clean stuff. <laughs> but thank you. Um, uh, again, my name's Sir Thomas uh, at Incremental Developers. Um, again, obviously uh, uh, a developer in, in term, I suppose. <laughs> Um, we, we certainly are more of a general contractor builder um, with, with a focus on developing properties incrementally, right? Um, highest and best use specifically in the ADU category. Um, next slide, please. So um, I'm not sure if you really can see this entire thing here. It might be zoomed out too much, but this is a, uh, an illustration from a company called Opticos Design. Um, I think they're out in California somewhere, and, and, and their principal, Ken Paralek, uh, came up with the term a while back of missing middle housing. Um, and I thought this is an interesting one because there's all these kind of terms that we don't happen to use a lot of in New England, um, and certainly Massachusetts, garden cluster, row house, uh, courtyard apartments. Um, but on the far left, and I'm not seeing it, and everybody else might not be seeing it either, to the left, a single family is one that says ADU, uh, which is what we focus on specifically. Um, and most folks on this, everybody knows it now because Austin just went through pretty in depth what an ADU is. Um, and we use different terms for them, uh, certainly locally and uh, across the country, but backyard cottages, uh, converted garage, uh, converted basement, converted attic, granny flat. Um, in Hawaii, they're called an Ohana flat. There it is there on the far left. Um, in in-law apartment sometimes. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the big differentiator is with an ADU um, is that it's not just that it's finished space. Really, it, it has to do that, that um, it's, it's really a range, right? Adding, adding a kitchen, a full kitchen, uh, a full bathroom, um, a lot of municipalities require separate entrances and egresses. Um, they cannot go through another one, uh, another existing unit. Um, there are oftentimes space requirements like ceiling height, uh, minimum space within the unit. Uh, and again, this kind of touches on what, what um, Austin was talking about as well. It is extremely fragmented um, because we do have to design and build around um, and starting with local codes, what is allowed, what is not allowed, uh, up to state codes, um, and then all the way up to IRC and IBC codes. Um, and I'll touch on it because it's in my notes. Uh, some people often ask about tiny homes. Um, an ADU is not a tiny home um, by code a, a lot of times. So uh, section Q of the IRC kind of goes through that, uh, what a tiny home is. Usually tiny home is something 250 square feet or less. Um, so that in, in ADU, that's not the differentiator of what a, necessarily a tiny home is. Um, so again, on the screen here, you can see just a good example uh, in, in this illustration of different types. Uh, in Boston specifically, we do a lot of carve outs. Um, Boston has a great ADU program that is already in place, and it's where we've built most of our um, existing units that, that we've uh, that we've done. And in Boston, currently uh, under their program, everything is when, within the existing 
building envelope. So uh, we can't really do converted garages or new standalone detached ADUs yet. If we have time and the moderators let me, um, again, people wondering why I'm in my car. <laughs> I kind of explained it a little bit beforehand, but uh, we just built a standalone detached ADU out in Oxford, Mass. Um, and Please we're show it. it up that now. would be great. <laughs> okay. As soon as I get through, I'll, I'll do a quick one or two minutes and you can, I'll, I'll, I'll hop off. Um, we had the, the fire marshal was here this morning going through certificate of occupancy. So I had to be here for the, uh, the signature. So um, next slide, please. <laughs> and actually, again, uh, well, this really wasn't planned, but this is a few months back during the uh, foundation pour out in Oxford. Um, so it's not just right 800 square feet. We still have to go through all of the paperwork, um, all of the um, creative process documents, um, there's probably north of 100 pages of individual um, documents and pages that we have to fill out and create, regardless of where the ADU is, um, just to build, again, 800 square feet. Uh, you know, we have to call out all those different divisions and trades to come out from excavation and foundation up to um, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, um, finishing trades, everybody. It's the same as building, you know, a fourplex, a multiplex, a giant three-family home. So um, this is really, I guess, the heart of what I'm trying to get to with the, these few minutes that I have, which is um, as a municipality, what makes things, and I'm, I think I'm actually wearing the exact same outfit in that, <laughs> in that picture, but um, <laughs> next slide, Christine is fine. Um, so, you know, building small, right? And, and that's kind of my point here is, um, we still create all of these documents at the top here, top right, um, are just 10 or so documents that the city of Boston requires for us to pull a permit. Um, they are, it's a by right permit in Boston, which makes things a little bit easier. Um, so it's very helpful. Um, Boston, again, is a little bit further along than the cities that are just passing AD, AD legislation. Um, and they really have a well thought out, well put together um, plan and process. So we know exactly uh, on that sheet sort of in the bottom, they have a single page PDF that I can pull up as uh, certainly as a contractor, but as a homeowner interested party and see what are the requirements that the city of Boston is looking for uh, in an ADU. So by providing those things um, right up front and letting us know what is allowed, what is not allowed. Um, so in, in, it's not that I'm saying it needs to be, uh, these documents have to be easy because a lot of the times they're not. We have to do uh, compliance for stretch code, i.e. CC, um, energy codes, uh, fire protection reports. And they're in-depth documents, there's a lot to them. Um, so it's not that the things have to be easy uh, for us to, to create, it's that we like to know um, what those what those documents are um as an example again i, I kind of pick it on boston simply because they're they are so well put together uh, and it's where we do most of our work but just about a month ago we put a permit in and we've done done um, about a dozen or so and uh, the engineer inspection engineer asked me for a homestead document um, some folks may know what a homestead document is others don't i certainly did not we kind of went into a panic it was holding everything up. And it turns out it was just really just a copy of the deed, part of the deed. The owner was able to find it within an hour. I sent it right over and everything was back on its way. But um, obviously we, as, like most people like to have every our ducks in a row when we submit that package. So it's just, again, one of those interesting parts if it's called out in um, that process, in that uh, application process right ahead, it, it lets us know. Um, number two here, I have, uh, you know, if it's special permit, is it by right? Um, certainly at the municipal level, who are the decision makers and the stakeholders that are involved for, um, for the process? So another town that we were working in um, during the inspection and occupancy process, um, you know, you have eight or nine signatures on that CO card. Um, and one of them was not the city assessor, but that is a requirement. So again, it kind of, um, you know, it's not that everything has to be perfect and things evolve, but uh, it's, it's thinking through these, these processes. Um, how do you go from a homeowner inquiring and wondering if they can build an ADU to actually 
behind me having, um, you know, turning over keys to a, a 900 square foot unit. Um, another thing that I, before we go to my sort of last slide and close up is um, again, asking questions. Another town that we're working with, um, it's my hometown, Salem. Um, and Salem, again, because of housing choice, recently was able to pass a DU legislation in that town. Um, and uh, the woman who's working on the program in Salem reached out and, and, and we've had some conversations with about um, <clears throat> how, how do you move this process forward? How do homeowners in the city of Salem find out how to build one? And, 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 and um, one thing that Boston does, again, is um, they do workshops once a month. And I, I, you know, we brought that up to Salem and um, it's a great point. Uh, it, it's something that's easy, uh, low barrier to entry, whether you do it online at a community center, uh, you can bring in folks, uh, you can bring in providers, contractors, architects, uh, designers, builders, um, providers from that community to answer questions. And then certainly folks from um, the building department, uh, from the planning department to answer questions because that's for us is the biggest sticking point for homeowners to be able to get one built. Um, next slide, please. And kind of wrapping up, uh, who we built for. Um, again, this wasn't necessarily planned with the AARP data, but um, number one, aging in place. Um, as Austin covered, uh, I recently, again, just a shout out to AARP, we, uh, I was on their website and they have a pretty easy to use interface on these different pages. And I, one or two clicks, enter my name, uh, shipping address, and I got three or four books in the mail. Uh, there's no cost to it. I think it's their um, ADU design guidelines um, and ADU best practices for municipalities to put an ADU practice in place. Um, those shipped out to me and I had them about a week later. Uh, family and generational. Um, so two or three of them that we've built have been for um, the kids when they home from college. Um, one was for parents actually moving into the smaller unit. Um, and then the kids and, and renting out the main unit. And then again, naturally affordable rentals. Um, one, uh, we're doing one in um, Brighton right now, uh, close to uh, BC. Uh, so again, you only have about 600, 600 square feet. So naturally that it's not gonna be a, you know, it's not gonna be thousands of dollars to rent. I think the homeowner is looking, you know, $1,500, $1,600 for this one bedroom brand new unit. Uh, down there in Brighton. So they're naturally affordable um, just by sort of guys, by design. Um, and, and again, I, I know kind of touched very high level. There's there's hundreds of things I could talk for hours, but um, I'm certainly willing to take uh, questions now. And then if anybody's looking to contact us, it's uh, Derek at incrementaldevelopers.com. Um, one or two other quick things, a great resource out there. Um, it was on the West Coast, they're kind of in a, a light years ahead of us on the East Coast here as far as ADU processes go. And the gentleman's name is Cole Peterson, and he runs an organization called AccessoryDwellings.org. Cole is kind of known as the uh, godfather of ADUs, but uh, AccessoryDwellings.org has a lot of great uh, resources. Um, I know that a lot of municipalities are hesitant and legally a lot of times not able to provide homeowners with specific referrals or contacts uh, for folks that build ADUs. We happen to, uh, maybe not by coincidence, we're the only ADU provider, designer and builder listed in Massachusetts on that accessorydwellings.org website. So um, as I push folks there, they usually end up reaching out to us. So um, that is, that is uh, my time and I appreciate everyone's help and certainly we'll open any questions. Derek, before we let you go, could you show the group? Uh, I'm, I'm not, could we sure. could you step see. out and show the group yeah. the project you're working on now, which we all enjoyed seeing. Oops. This year. Mm. Yeah. Okay, let me see. How do I turn my, there we go, is my camera. Okay, here we go. Can we you see got, it okay? Yeah. I'm not sure. How about this, is that okay? Yeah. Good. Okay, great. So again, here's the main home. Um, obviously, they have a great, nice piece of land here, um, existing home and structure. And the idea was to build this uh, about 800, 900 square foot unit for the parents that are moving home from Arizona, uh, which they have. This took us about um, a little bit less than a year from original contact to well, where we are now, which is um, final 
uh, building inspection is tomorrow. Um, so it's a standalone unit, single story, uh, has a full basement, uh, which we access through what they call a doghouse dormer down here. Um, again, uh, we did what they call a, a brick shelf design in the um, a brick ledge design in the foundation. So it allowed a lower entry level here. Um, wow. Uh, Derek, did they, have, did they have an exist, was that a uh, structure already there or was that a completely reconstructed from the ground up? Yeah, this is a stick built from the ground up. And did, the, did they get assistance to help build this or did they come up with like a part of the cash on their own? And I, I, I'll step outside because I think they're kind of breaking up. I just want to make sure that everyone can hear me. Um, you no, know, there was no assistance. The town of Oxford uh, does not have any programs in place. This was. Oh, we didn't hear you, Derek. Here, hold on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it switched over to my Bluetooth my talk. Sorry. <laughs> Perils of being on a job site here. Um. So yeah, they they built this um on their own finance from selling the home out in uh, Arizona. Um. Again, just by example, Boston does have a fifty thousand dollar loan program under their um. Uh, I forget the name of the exact program, but the, their housing programs in Boston. It's not a yeah, grant. Yeah, the Boston Home Center. I know that they have the ADUs. Boston but Home Center. They, yeah, the Boston Home Center. But they actually, um, with the Boston Home Center, you actually, like, so I have a three-family and I have a flat roof. And if I wanted to put, like, a dormer on top, I would have already, the dormer without, the space needs to already be created for me to be able to do that. Like, so they wouldn't, like, allow me to like build you know something that's not already there that's the only reason why i was asking about that particular yeah. program so they make it kind yeah. of hard in the city they don't make it easy and even if you want a basement dwelling they don't make it easy um for you it's um very restrictive you have to have a certain height the windows have to be a certain feet the door has to be a certain um yeah structure you know so it's not like an easy task in the city of austin i didn't know if they were trying to make that those options well, like easier for people or not so 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 in your ear I, I i somewhat agree with you right so and and i mentioned this sort of earlier on right it's it's not that it's supposed to be um or that i need it to be easy an easy process because building something um never really is right every the first and foremost it's about safety. Um, units, dwellings, habitable units have to be safe. Um, they have to be built to, right, and in Boston, we kind of have a different standard here because we have such a long history. There's been a lot of, um, you know, tragedies with fires and the way things used to be built right back to the late 1600s, early 1700s, right? In the middle of the country, in the West Coast, it's a little bit differently. So Boston, yes, um, and like a lot of cities and towns, the, the building codes to construct an ADU, um, it, it, they, they're, they, they, they can be tough to navigate sometimes because you are still dealing with, as I mentioned, all the same codes that um, you have to build to, to a very high standard. Um, yeah, Boston doesn't allow things um, in addition to what they call FAR or floor area ratio. It has to be within the existing building structure, building envelope. Um, but again, to their credit, these things are known ahead of time, right? So it's generally a homeowner um, on their own is not going to really ever build a single family home or multifamily unit on their own. You're, what are you going to do? You're going to hire an architect. You're going to hire a designer and a builder, a uh, general contractor and all your subs, all that stuff. So that's up to them. And that's sort of what, what we specialize in and, and have worked out over the past uh, two years here is how to, you know, what that process is and what that, not, not, certainly not a secret formula, um, it, it, it's uh, it's not rocket science, but it is a science. So we've been working on that that, that one ourselves. So is it better to like? Look, Lisa. To... I'm sorry, Kate. No, no, it's okay. That that serious voice you're all hearing is our own, Lucisa at, at at MHP, who is so knowledgeable about all this stuff. A city of Boston resident and works in one more one more. Um. 
I want to, I have a question for you, but I think Hannah has quite a bit to say, but when I want to put in the parking lot for you to answer, if we have time at the end, is um, one of the biggest issues we hear about ADUs is um, wastewater and drinking water supplies. So even some communities that allow them then spin around and say, but the wastewater treatment plant requires an enormous lot. So I'm curious how you've sort of, have you had to put in new wastewater? But I think we need to move to Hannah and hopefully we'll have time to, to swing back to that question. So Hannah. Yes, um, if I could. Is the legislative liaison for the city of Somerville, and she's going to do her presentation. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to um, talk to you all today. And that was really interesting about accessory building units. It's, it's quite a topic. So I appreciate getting to, to hear the, the prior two presentations as well. But um, as noted, my name is Hannah Cantedro. I work in the mayor's office of the city of Somerville as the legislative liaison. Um, most of what I'm going to be talking about is work that I have done in my former position as the housing policy coordinator in the housing division. Um, I've only been in my new role since June, so it's a, it's a bit of a transition for me, but some of this work I was able to, to keep with me. So I'm very excited to be able to talk to you about it today. Um, so I'm gonna talk about three different tools that the city of Somerville has been using um, you know, to try to combat everything that's going on in our housing market right now. Um, so I'm gonna talk about condominium conversion, um, community land trusts and our local nonprofit partners, and then I'll close um, talking about some policy advocacy efforts that we are currently, um, you know, going at full force right now. So just for a little bit of background on condominium conversion regulation, um, state law does allow any municipality in the Commonwealth to regulate condo conversion in properties that are larger than four units. Um, in Somerville, we actually obtained special permission in 1985 to go beyond that. So in Somerville, we regulate all condominium conversions of existing properties. Um, for other municipalities, they would have to do a home rule petition in order to um, regulate two and three family properties, meaning you'd have to go to the state and, and basically request permission from the state to regulate those smaller properties. But as it stands, any municipality can regulate um, four units and above. Um, and these, these slides will be shared as, um, as uh, was noted before, but this, so I do have a link um, to a little bit more information about what other municipalities do as well. Um, I'm pretty sure Somerville is the most strict about condo conversion, um, but we are certainly not the only. Um, so a couple of key components that I did want to touch on were, and you know, why I'm talking about condominium conversion, right? Without any context, it seems like a bit of a random topic, um, but through condo conversion, we actually have our strongest tenant protections. Um, so if a tenant is in a unit that is going to be converted to condo, they have a minimum of a one year notice period where they cannot be evicted during that time for the purposes of um, you know, facilitating the condo conversion or anything like that. Um, if a unit is gonna be converted that um, is occupied by somebody who is elderly, disabled or low income, they have more time. They have up to five years of a notice period and they are also entitled to assistance from their property owners um, in helping them to find a comparable unit. If a property owner fails to do that, then the tenant gets an extra two years and they go all the way up to seven years. So that's a, an incredibly strong tenant protection um, when you compare that to a situation where, you know, a property owner is just selling a building, right? Those tenants are not necessarily entitled to any tenant protection. Um, tenants are also entitled to a relocation payment of six to uh, $10,000 to the higher end um, for those who are elderly, disabled, or low income. Um, and there's also a waiting period for any vacant units. So, um, you know, what used to happen a lot is that property owners would buy properties, displace the tenants, and submit an application to convert a vacant property to condo, and would be able to do so in a very short amount of time. Um, that's no longer the case. The City of Somerville did update its ordinance in 2019 to include this really important provision um, that requires a waiting period of one year for any vacant unit that was formerly a rental unit before it can be sold as a condo unit. Um, so, you know, it's a fairly strong deterrent because now it's not faster to convert a vacant property versus converting a tenancy property. Um, but the, the main big reason I wanted to talk about condo conversion in terms of, of um, this panel today is that it also includes a right to purchase. So this has always been the case in Somerville is that um, tenants have always had the right to purchase their units. 
But as, as we all know, just having a right doesn't necessarily mean you can exercise that right. If you don't have funds, you obviously cannot purchase your unit. Um, so when we updated the ordinance, we kind of added a second right to purchase. So the tenants still absolutely have the right to purchase, um, but the city or affordable housing designee also has a right to purchase if the tenant is waived, if the tenant has waived their right, or if the unit is vacant. So we've created a, a pipeline of units essentially. Um, so every month we get applications for condominium conversions and the vast majority of them in some way or another, at least one of the units in the property is gonna have to be um, offered to the city um, slash designee for purchase. At this point in time, we do not have a funding source for this. So we have not been able to actually um, purchase any units, but we have this, this active pipeline that could potentially you know, proactively prevent displacement. So a lot of what I'm talking about, you know, these things, they all kind of work together and they all take a lot um, to make happen. So a lot of this is kind of foundation building and we are still very much in the process of being able to actualize the benefits of the foundation that we've, we've got. But this is, is a really critical piece for the right to purchase. So, you know, hypothetically, um, a municipality without having to get state permission could implement or could, you know, drafted and, and approve an ordinance that would regulate condo conversion. And yes, it's, it's only four plus units. And I know a lot of our communities, you know, the majority of our housing stock is, is, is smaller units, it's two and three families. Um, but, you know, having that right to purchase for the bigger buildings could really make a difference in terms of, you know, being able to save tenancy. Um, so now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about another um, big effort that we've made in the city of Somerville and in the community of Somerville, um, which is to establish a community land trust. Um, this is a nonprofit independent organization that has worked very closely with the city. Um, the city has, you know, a really great program called the 100 Homes Program that um, is a collaboration between our the city and our local community development corporation, Somerville Community Corporation. Um, and this program is really unique because it, it does allow for the city and SEC to purchase properties that are about to be sold that are occupied and allows us to prevent displacement actively again. So it is another tool to do that. So this is our only functioning tool right now is the 100 Homes Program. Um, but our hope is that the land trust, um, as it grows, will eventually be able to kind of be a part of that program as well and be an additional vehicle that the city can use um, to expand the 100 Homes Program and, um, you know, kind of further our efforts in terms of being able to purchase these occupied properties and, and save these tenancies. Um, and we also have a hope that the land trust could potentially be able to, you know, purchase um, units that come online through the right to purchase through condo conversion. So these things do kind of all hopefully mesh together. Um, obviously, the biggest part of that is finding funding to purchase these properties. But what we're really doing is developing mechanisms and developing ways where we can acquire properties. Um, you know, it's just a matter of kind of building all of the blocks together. Um, and, you know, I can't stress enough in terms of how important the municipality and the city itself has been in supporting the land trust and, um, you know, supporting these efforts because that is really crucial. The city has provided funding to, um, you know, allow for startup costs and, and the land trust is about to hire its first um, staff person in the coming months. So really exciting um, movement there. Um, but like I said, nothing is really happening without funding, right? And that's where policy advocacy um, comes in and it's just so, so essential. So right now, um, the city and, and not only the city, the region, right, is putting a lot of its, its energies into these bills. The first one being the real estate transfer fee bill. Um, second is right to uh, first right of uh, right to purchase, right of first refusal, um, and the right to counsel. There are a ton of other amazing bills out there that do a lot of great things. But I, you know, limited time. I just wanted to give you a quick snapshot of these three because they are really critical. Um, real estate transfer fee. It's a 0.5 to two percent fee on any real estate transaction. The municipality is the one that would really, um, you know, kind of dictate how it would work. So we're advocating for this enabling legislation um, that would then, you know, the municipality would have to go in and craft it to how it would work for their own community. So for example, in Somerville, we would be exempting all of our occupants from that fee. But the real critical piece of this is that it would be a reliable source of funding that has to go for affordable housing. 
it would allow us to, you know, put funds towards exercising the right to purchase or put funds towards enabling the land trust to either exercise that right or buy a property that's about to be sold that's full of tenants. So the, the revenue stream that the right to, uh, excuse me, that the, the transfer fee would produce, you know, can really kind of enable all of these other things to really work to their full potential. Because right now, yes, the tenant protections are working really well for condo conversion, but we are missing out by not being able to purchase the units that are coming online, that are becoming available through the right to purchase. Um, the other bills, you know, the other bill I want to talk about, the first right of refusal, is basically an expansion of that. So we have a little right to purchase in our condo conversion ordinance, but the right of first refusal is enabling legislation that would allow a municipality to opt in again, like the transfer fee, um, and establish their own you know, right to purchase program in their city. Um, so this would just really expand that ability and it would expand not only tenants' abilities to purchase, but also those supportive nonprofit organizations, um, CDCs and the like to potentially partner with tenants and, and help to save their tenancies as well. The last one is just the right to counsel, which is just incredibly important. It's so vital that our tenants are, are given a fair shot in terms of being able to maintain their tenancies. Um, so all these links are available on the slides that will be sent out. So definitely, you know, take another look and, um, you know, feel free to, to ask any questions or anything like that. They're all very much active and need lots of volunteers. So if you're interested in working on any of those bills, definitely let me know. Um, but the main point I'm trying to make here is that there is no one policy that will get us anywhere, right? All of these things really have to work together. And so like, I'm, I'm super proud of our condominium conversion ordinance, but it has a long way to go. And I'm really, really proud of our community land trust as well, but it has a long way to go. We need these other pieces. And there's only so much you can do as a municipality in a vacuum, right? This is very much a regional everywhere issue. Um, and, you know, the work that we're doing on the, at the state house to, to try to get these bills passed is, is definitely not just some of them, right? It's, it's everyone trying to, to move together to unlock all of these tools, because we all know that there's not just one answer and that these things all do kind of work together and they need each other, right? We can't just have a right if we don't have a funding source. Um, so I will leave it at that. Sorry, I know that was a lot and it was a really different topic. So if I left out any context, definitely uh, happy to answer any questions. And like I said, feel free to reach out. Hannah, that was wonderful. So much information, but I, I think we need to slow it down and get a whole <laughs> panel from you on these, on these topics. Um, yeah, I certainly big topics. <laughs> I do have one question for you. Um, I'm keeping an eye on the chat, so I'll let anyone else take a turn first. But again, I'm very new to these, the concept. The condo conversion, if it's a multi-unit building, and so there would then be some units in there that are owned and some that are rented, or is it? does it have to be a group effort by everyone? Yeah, so welcome to the... the complicatedness that is condo conversion. So you can't convert part of a building. You have to gotcha. either convert the whole building or not. Um, and what we did in Somerville is that we, we instituted, um, there's an expiration date on your permit because what a lot of folks were doing in the past was that they were getting a permit, you know, when they had the thought, oh, I might be able to maximize my property value if I convert to condos, but I have tenants. So let me just get this permit. And then, you know, maybe when I feel like it in 10 years, five years, I'm just going to displace all my tenants and go ahead and sell this condo. So to avoid that, we have an expiration date on the permits, um, which means that if you're a property owner looking to convert and to continue to rent, your permit will expire. It needs to be sold as a condo at least once um, because we obviously we can't regulate every single sale of every single condo, but that initial sale needs to be made as a condo. Um, and then, you know, subsequently, how are property owners, if they want to rent their condo, they can, but it has to be sold as a condo, at least that initial sale for us, it will expire. Wow, that's, that's a lot. Um, and similarly, I had a question about the commute, the status of the community land trust in Somerville. Is it so what, where is it at now, the creation of it? Yeah, it is, it is a full-fledged organization. It is a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, it is 
currently fully volunteer operated, but as I said, um, the city did actually appropriate funds for the land trust to go ahead and um, hire an executive director and hopefully an organizer as well. So we are in, the, and I say we, because I also volunteer with the land trust and it's like, it's very close <laughs> to me. So I am very invested in that organization and, and um, you know, we are making really great progress in terms of figuring out how we want to go ahead and find and hire our first executive director and kind of just mapping out, you know, the next, I don't even know how, it's kind of hard to do long range mapping when everything is changing very quickly, but we are trying to kind of, you know, shore up our, our plan as we move forward. But hiring that first person is going to be huge and we are really excited for that. Um, one of our attendees, MJ Adams, just put a great resource into the uh, chat that everyone should take a peek at about condo conversions. So thank you for that. Um, I do I do want to just swing back to my question for Derek. Um, I don't see if anyone wants to ask a question, you can raise your hand. I'll keep an eye on the gallery. Um, but I did want to ask you a little bit about this wastewater issue. And I wanted to ask Austin this too, if this has come up, um, you know, particularly just say Cape Cod or, you know, we have very sensitive environmental areas in Massachusetts where there are limitations to how much waste can go into the ground on a certain lot. And I'm curious if either of you are aware of any creative solutions for this or how they deal with bedroom counts or, or how that, you know, how that has worked, like shared systems, anything like that. Derek, I don't know if you have any thoughts. No, uh, the short answer is, is no. Um, in, uh, you know, the, again, when we're building in cities, it's usually snapping into existing municipal systems. Um, this one in Oxford is well water, has not been an issue, wasn't an issue. And they're existing, we did have to do a Title V engineering report. And they had a, I don't know, it was called a 1500 gallon tank existing. Um, and the way they work is obviously the tank is based off of um, is it, it's bedrooms. So it's not bathrooms. I always get confused. It's the number of bedrooms that are feeding into that system. So, um, the existing home had two or three bedrooms. It allows up to five on that system. So all we did with the ADU was add technically add one bedroom to that system. Um, and that met the requirements for, for the title five. Austin, I don't know if you have anything to add. Similar answer here, and just to say that it is addressed in our model ordinance and suggests that where possible cities and towns try to accommodate in exactly the way Derek's describing, where the ADU is treated as just connected to the existing system rather than um, completely separate or licensed separately. Um, I don't see any other questions, and we are coming up on a break, unless anyone else. Christine, it looks like you have a question. Do. Thank you, Katie, and thank you to all the panelists for all this great information. I had a question for Austin. I think in your presentation, you referenced three poison pills for the ADU ordinances or bylaws. And I was wondering if you can expand on that a little bit more, in particular, the owner occupancy requirement, because I, I think that's just in my own experience, I feel like that's one way to get buy-in from the community saying that, you know, people who lived here already will continue to live here through this owner occupancy requirement. Uh, and I want, I'm wondering why you label that as a poison pill, if you have any examples yeah. you can share. So what I'll say is there's a big difference between requiring one of the two units to be owner occupied and requiring both of them to be owner occupied. So that the real poison pill in our view is requiring that both of them be owner occupied, essentially restricting it only to friends and family members so that you can't rent it out. Um, a requirement that one or, or requiring that it be the main house that's owner occupied. Both of those really restrict the modes of use but requiring that only one of them be occupied such that the original owner could either rent out the ADU or move to the ADU themselves, particularly if you're making, uh, like Derek was showing there, a more uh, accessible, friendly um, ADU and then rent out the main house, that really expands the, the modes that it could be used uh, and makes it easier. So um, when we say owner occupancy is a poison pill, what we usually are talking about is requiring that both units be essentially owner occupied is pretty restrictive. 
that really clears up a lot in my head. Yeah, I, real, I realize I'm, I'm blitzing through slides with just a couple of words on them, but um, a lot of places in the Commonwealth require, if they have ADUs, that one of the two be, be occupied by the owner. Well, given that we're, um, time is pretty much up, I wanted to just thank everyone, Hannah, Austin, and Derek. Those were amazing presentations, and I'm so glad we recorded this because um, these are questions we get asked a lot, and I think staff at MHP, we're going to have to go back and review these and take some notes so that we can explain these things to people because a lot of the stuff, for instance, Hannah was talking about, I really have not been able to explain properly. So thank you so much. Um, we're going to come up on a five break. Uh, what do you think, Christine? Oh, wait. Late breaking news. Chris Hayes has a question. Oh, that's, we can worth it. Answer in the next chat. Never mind. I think we're going to stop and take our break. Um, and Christine, uh, five minutes. Come back at 1102. Oh, uh, so we can either answer Chris's question here or come back during the break since we do have some ADU experts on the Terrific. panel. Let's, why don't we just take it on right now? Chris Hayes asked Does anyone have any? stories undertaking community opposition for ADUs, especially concerns about traffic, street parking, or it will be, they're gonna be loud students. And we can, we can ask the next group this too. They're gonna to be talking about sort of community response. But I'm curious if you've dealt with that, Derek. Um, yes and no, I, I, I would say, show me the data, right? Show me where anybody has built, uh, you know, any number of ADUs in any city or town and that, um, you know, they've been the cause of uh, raucous parties and parking issues and, and all that stuff. I, you know, I always go back to, right, parking is, isn't, isn't a right. It's like, um, you know, a single family home on a street can have four college age kids, six cars in the driveway, right? Um, but an ADU built downtown in a, a commuting city, walkable city, most likely that 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 single occupant probably doesn't even have a car and that's just you know that's just how the numbers work um and the other tough thing about it is that right when you go to advocate for an adu or advocate for change um at at the city level and these you have these things it, it's the people that are going to be living in that adu in the future that is not currently built aren't there they're not there to advocate for that that process from that home that they're eventually going to be living in it's um that sort of nimbyism um, and, and the, the, the vocal minority that seem to show up and, and oppose it. So, yeah, I, I'm always happy to go to, um, you know, and, and voice uh, the, <laughs> the uh, uh, happy ADU side of things. Um, I'd say Derek took the words right out of my mouth uh, right there at the beginning. Uh, it's exactly the situation that we run into and that we've seen in some communities. There, there's, you know, uh, we, we tell people exactly that, you know, you're gonna have more traffic noise and people around with teenagers across the street than you are with an ADU. Uh, and particularly with the audience here being gateway cities, which tend to have a little more density or, or have some better transit options. Um, you know, uh, like Derek said, you're, you're likely to have someone who doesn't need their own car, doesn't need parking. Um, and adding an ADU to a home is a lot less disruptive to the neighborhood than, um, you know, a full redo of, the lot into you know something else so um, we have some really good data about how ADUs actually get used and what the impact is and we have found in a lot of communities that people are actually really receptive to that and really receptive to the messaging about ADUs allowing the people who currently live in community to remain in community that this is not something for you know people coming in uh, from away this is really a way to let neighborhood members retain ownership of their home get some extra income and stay in the neighborhood as they age. And that is a really powerful message in overcoming some of that community opposition. Hey, do you mind if I chime in real quick? This is Christine. Uh, so I, I think the opposition that you hear from communities tend to be from, like Derek said, from the kind of local minority and they tend to be more, uh, very securely honed. They have bigger homes or they live in less dense neighborhoods, even in gateway cities. But if you really look at the data from ARP that Austin shared, 
And here in Salem, when we were trying to push the, the ADU ordinance through, we did a citywide poll. Uh, we have a resident survey every year. We did a citywide poll and 75% of residents want it. So the, the concept of ADUs is not new. A lot of people already live in these apart, these kind of attic basement apartments. It's something that we're familiar with. And even though eight, the, the phrase ADU might be a, a new term to many people, it's actually the way people have, have lived for hundreds of years in a region like New England. And we're just trying to keep people who, who live in their own communities, stay in their own communities. And just really just, I think it takes a lot of political will to overcome the opposition, but really keep in mind, this is something that's popular that people are open to. And it's, it's you always hear from the local, the, the Lao minority. So um, we just need some political courage for the elected official to vote for it. And if I could just add, now is really the time to be pushing on every policy that we can. Like now is the moment to like push hard. I think we better stop with that because that is the truth. And uh, we have our, another great panel coming up of people talking about sort of how they got that done, Hannah, um, how they motivated the community. So again, we're gonna, thanks again to all of you. You've been terrific. And we're, we're gonna take a break um, and be back in five minutes. Thank you. Thanks everyone.
uh, everyone, everyone's back. Um, we're going to have a, a panel discussion at this point, and we're hoping someone, people will chime in. We have an amazing group here. Um, Laura Holmes with the Revere Housing Coalition and Whitney Demetrius uh, are, can talk a little bit about some work they did in Revere around um, affordable housing trusts. Um, Evans Petrini from the city of Malden is gonna talk about community engagement there. And then finally, Jesse Canson Benenaf is from Abundant Housing Massachusetts is gonna tell us some experiences. Um, you probably are all familiar with Abundant Housing Mass. If not, you should be um, working, building support at the ground level in communities for new housing efforts. So I think we're gonna just start, this is sort of an informal discussion. Um, and I think we'll just start by asking Whitney and Lore to reflect a little bit about the work they did in Revere to get inclusionary, excuse me, to get an affordable housing trust created and sort of where that may be going now in terms of um, moving forward with inclusionary zoning. So we'd love to just hear you guys talk a little bit about that. Thanks so much, Katie. Um, excited to be here, joined by my uh, colleague, Lore, to talk about some of the work we've been doing uh, in Revere. And certainly the part one of today's session really segued nicely into uh, to our conversation, which we'll be talking a little bit about how to build political will, right? Um, I'm gonna share my screen just to acclimate folks who may not be as familiar um, with what we do here at CHAPA. Um, again, my name is Whitney Demetrius. I am the Fair Housing uh, Director of Fair Housing Engagement at CHAPA. And some of what we have been historically known to do at CHAPA is work around production, preservation, and prosperity in housing, right? Um, but in the more recent years, we realized this premise that um, community support really makes or breaks development at the local level, right? Um, but many communities don't have a sort of strong, viable coalition that really works on uh, supportive housing, affordable housing um, agendas. And so in light of that, we started in the last three years or so, it's a rather new program, um, which was uh, funded by MHP, the Municipal Engagement Initiative Program, which worked to build support for affordable housing production in communities across the state. Uh, and so we worked in several communities and I'm excited to have uh, Laura really share about some of what we've been able to do in Revere. But as you can see, we have a long list of other communities that we work with uh, closely doing similar sort of work, right? It's not, doesn't quite touch the 351 municipalities, but we have partners and friends uh, who you'll be hearing from as well who are working uh, similarly on um, similar efforts as well. Uh, and so in this coalition building model, right, we bring together the various stakeholders. I heard um, that alluded to earlier in the call, right? Who are the stakeholders when you come into a community, when you're trying to get things done, when you're trying to change the zoning, so that actually ADUs can actually get built, right? How do you build that political will? And so in this model, we're bringing together municipal staff, elected officials, housing advocates and developers, but also local businesses, civic groups, houses of worship, environmentalist groups, residents, Black Lives Matter supporters, just everyone kind of helping them to see how their vested interest overlaps with, with certainly with housing at its core. Um, and in doing so, we're constantly thinking about who is not at the table, right? Uh, what are the barriers for participation? We talk about how oftentimes people who come out to speak out against a particular development or a particular policy or, or zoning change are themselves stably housed. I think Christine was talking about that. Are themselves homeowners and coming out in opposition to new uh, rental housing development? Um, but how do we get the majority of the community to really come out, to speak out on um, you know, how they feel, right? And oftentimes being in support of something, oftentimes we get uh, energized around things that we are in opposition to. But in this model, we sort of bring together the voices um, that are sometimes often underrepresented. 
Um, and so we're thinking about access, right? About meetings, is there food? What is the time of the meeting? Is there translation? Um, are we mindful of the digital divide when having these meetings and convenings? But certainly in various communities, each uh, model is unique. And uh, the way that we measure success is really different in terms of, is the coalition actually viable? Does housing get built? Does do um, you know um, policies get changed and get, get enacted, et cetera? Um, and so we have various local strategies in terms of how to build that support, how to grow that network and how to share um, show a shared collective responsibility that really in many ways pulls at the heartstrings of the work and the sort of understanding the larger scheme of the work we're doing. Um, certainly we use much of the data um, course, um, MHP's data town tool has, which has been great in sort of framing the narrative as these stakeholders, this, then these, this coalition of residents and, um, and advocates in the space work to do op-eds, do things on social media, um, give public comment at town meetings, um, and participate in myth busting. So we utilize the data to support what we know uh, to get those things done and change in the community. So certainly there's many challenges as far as the role of municipalities, um, right? Momentum and fatigue, right? Meeting fatigue. I think some of us even on this call today, right? We, we have this Zoom fatigue, we're on these calls, but understanding many of the challenges again around the COVID-19 um, pandemic um, and sort of conflicting concerns, conflicting crises that are often going on, but really helping people to see how those things overlap and sort of uh, adjusting and, and creating flexible models to continue the work because the coalitions we try to strive to do and create, uh, we hope would be viable past the moment, right? Past the um, just trying to get a development done or zoning changed. Um, and so there's models that we have in our MEI housing um, toolkit to for how communities can sort of get this sort of effort started in their own local communities. You can certainly use our, our, our network to tell us where you live so we can connect you with other housing advocates. But I'll talk a little bit about what we've been able to do in Lynn. So we're, I listed a few of the communities we're in, one of which is the Lynn Housing Coalition. They had been faced with um, certainly the housing production plan. Um, and so you can see here, this is just a clip of their Linktree website where they are talking about, uh, you know, putting together a petition to get people to sign up and, as they were supporting the housing production plan. Um, they put together candidate questionnaires, right? They wrote op-eds. Um, they have a strong mission, right? Really that is centered around lenders being committed to creative, safe and affordable housing. Um, and in doing so, they really have built a large momentum around the petition, right, in support of the housing production plan, over 200 signatures, it eventually got passed through the city council and the planning board, but it was a really huge effort um, done by the coalition there to really get that uh, moving and get that across. They certainly have done candidate questionnaires. Um, around housing questions that was then posted in their local newspaper. So there's just so many different things that you can do to kind of turn the tile, turn the, the tone of the folks who are oftentimes coming out in support of things. But I'm excited to turn it over to uh, Laura Holmes, who is our the community lead at the Revere Housing Coalition. She'll talk a little bit about what they have been able to do. And I think to your point, Katie, about around uh, creating an uh, affordable housing trust and their efforts now moving forward around inclusionary zoning. So I'll turn it over to Laura. Thanks, Whitney. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Great to be with you from Revere. Um, <clears throat> I sort of feel like uh, we are the baby coalition, uh, certainly that I know of. We, we, and we started our organizing during the pandemic. I think there were some, some factors that really supported us to leap forward. Uh, affordable housing has been something that I've personally been concerned about forever and ever. I was a displaced from Jamaica Plain before I moved to Revere. And part of what attracted to me, attracted me to Revere were the same 
qualities where I had moved to Jamaica Plain 30 years earlier, which was a diverse community, beautiful, the beaches here, or, you know, other green spaces in Jamaica Plain, but beautiful, diverse housing stock. I really saw it as, as attractive and I feared gentrification would be coming soon to Revere, um, which of course has, has heated up and heated up and heated up. Uh, we don't have a problem with development. We have a problem of unequal development. Uh, a fortuitous uh, circumstance, I think, that, that led to uh, us uh, beginning the coalition were really two things. One was um, a positively inclined uh, progressive um, administration at the city level, where we have a mayor and folks on the mayor's staff who um, are concerned about issues for the broad community um, and had undertaken uh, a, a master planning process. And surprise, surprise, the biggest issue in the community that came, came from this participatory master planning process was the need for affordable housing. And before that time, I mean, before now, there has been zero um, ordinances or, or any kind of uh, municipal um, strategies around developing or retaining affordable housing or stabilizing neighborhoods. This language is, you know, completely new in Revere just in the last few years. So following on the heels of that master planning process and all that great data that kind of had buy-in from the city and had engaged lots and lots of residents, hundreds of residents across the city, um, in steps Chapa you know, offering to help us with their municipal engagement initiative. And um, we began to gather and, and this is COVID times. This, this, <laughs> this coalition was, was birthed to be a diverse, robust participatory coalition and it was all done on Zoom. Crazy, right? But that's where we're living. Um, and so we, uh, you know, we, I guess I felt very connected. I jumped in right away. Quite a few other community activists. We have a really great diverse core of, of activists who show up for each other, show up for the nonprofits, show up for our immigrant communities, you know, push to make sure things are translated, materials are accessible. And so we started to generate interest just through those networks and started to put together monthly meetings. I had a lot of conversations with people. Um, and, and it's worked. I think a lot of the reason it, it has, has worked has been um, because we have really done well at getting people's voices in the room and engaging them. The first thing I heard as I started having conversations with my neighbors about affordable housing was this stuff, I don't even understand this stuff. I don't know what inclusionary zoning is. I don't know what an affordable housing trust is. So, you know, we pretty quickly just moved to, this is gonna be a space where we're gonna educate ourselves about housing, what it means to create affordable housing, what it means to stabilize our neighborhoods. And we're gonna just take it, take that elephant one bite at a time and try and figure it out. And that's exactly what we've done with a lot of, you know, input from participants who say, I wanna know more about this. We've also been sort of, um, you know, fortunate to have early on been uh, offered a consultative role with the city. In other words, we've been invited to the table. And I think, I think that has gotten stronger as we've increased our membership. We have a membership in our coalition now, about 70 people. Um, not everybody as in any coalition is as active as the others, but um, by having that beginning of a structure, we were able to show up when the, the mayor proposed an affordable housing trust fund. And we were able to be brought in before that ordinance was presented to city council to learn what their ideas were about it. And then we were able to huddle together as community residents um, and those who want to champion community residents and back us up, our allies, I guess, our accomplices. Um, to, to think about what would be important to us in an affordable housing trust fund. And, and we 
shared with each other. We went to, to, to meetings of, of various organizations where members like I'm, I'm active with um, Women Encouraging Empowerment, which is serving immigrant women and families, went to their meetings and went to parent leader meetings um, to, to talk about this and, and encourage people to show up at the city council, the public hearing. I think it was the first public hearing the city held uh, in person since the pandemic. And you can see that photo on the, the left on Whitney's slide um, shows people who showed up to testify in favor of that affordable housing trust ordinance. And it passed. And um, we actually also have gotten, uh, I believe two of our Rear Housing Coalition members are now on the board for that Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Um, so we're excited about the potential for that. Of course, now we got to figure out how to get money into that trust fund and have it get spent the ways we want. So we're on to inclusionary zoning. And I remember when I first um, started, somebody give me a, a heads up if I should stop talking because I don't know what's going on with the timing, but- We're, um, we're doing okay, maybe another minute or two. Great, perfect, that's all I need. Um, so we, you know, we've been now uh, educating ourselves about inclusionary zoning. We've been getting out whenever there's community events so that we can meet up with people in person. My neighborhood, Shirley Ave neighborhood, um, has been the subject of a lot of development and a lot of displacement. And so we went to a, a street fair that, that we had uh, about a month back and signed on 17 new members to the coalition just by, just by showing up there. And that was the other photo in, in Whitney's, Whitney's <laughs> deck was, was, I forgot to take pictures while we were at the fair, but later that afternoon, I took one in my patio. <laughs> <laughs> with Fatu, who's, who's, who's one of our members. Um, so now we're le learning about inclusionary zoning and um, uh, helping with a, a participate in the city process, but at the same time, you know, we stay clear that we're all about advocacy. We're all about the residents. We are not representing the city. We're not just carrying water for the, phys for the city. We will collaborate and work with them, but our job is one thing. We advocate for more affordable housing that suits the needs of residents who live right now in the city of Revere and want to keep living there. Well, so Laura and Whitney, that was great, really inspirational. Um, it's really a conversation, so people should chime in if they have other questions. But speaking of inclusionary zoning, I'm really eager to hear Evan speak a little bit about Malden's efforts and sort of how they built support for that. My, I'm sort of an inclusionary zoning geek uh, in, and very interested in it. Um, my memory is there was a couple false starts, uh, efforts that didn't go forward. The resulting bylaw that it's an ordinance actually that has emerged, I think is one of the most interesting ones I've seen. It's really great. Um, so, and maybe we can, maybe I'll dig that up and see if I can share it with the group. But Evan, I didn't know if you wanted to talk about sort of how you moved the community to go ahead and um, adopt that. Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, I don't have a, a PowerPoint, but I'll just kind of, um, you know, talk about what we've been doing for the last couple of years. And, and I think we're, we're, maybe we're like a year ahead of where Revere is right now. Um, because back in 2019, um, so we, we had engaged with MAPC on developing a housing production plan actually before that, but it was, uh, because, so I'll give a little bit of context. Malden has, um, built around 2000 units of new housing, uh, between 2010 and 2020. Um, and because of that, there was a lot of anti- housing sentiment that, um, that, that arose. We actually had a housing moratorium in, I think, 2016, and then another one in 2017. Um, so there, there was a lot of anti-housing, but, but one of the things that we kind of latched on to um, when, so the housing production plan was, was pared back and we just completed a, a needs assessment 
Um, so that was completed in, in kind of the summer of 2019. And, and we felt, you know, our department that we, we had to do something. Um, we had to kind of respond to this uh, in some way because, you know, some of the, the kind of stark uh, things that, that came out of that um, were that, you know, 56% of our households are, are low income. Uh, almost half of uh, our households in, in general are, are cost burdened. And there's, there's only one deed restricted unit for every um, five low income households. So we know, you know, there's a great need for affordable housing. So what we, what we did, um, you know, the mayor proposed a couple uh, strategies for addressing uh, affordability in Malden. And, and Malden, you know, in general, folks in, in Malden have prided um, you know, the, the city on being an affordable place for, for families and, and folks to, to live. Um, and that's, you know, rapidly changing as, as we kind of, you know, saw in concrete terms in the, in the housing needs assessment. So what we proposed, you know, back in 2019 was the establishment of an affordable housing trust fund. Um, and uh, at the time we were just kind of saying we wanted commitment from the council that we could explore, um, you know, uh, an inclusionary zoning ordinance. What we had kind of proposed at the time um, was uh, that we needed to do a financial feasibility study to make sure that how we were designing um, the ordinance, you know, fit with the realities of Malden. It would result in in real projects. It wouldn't be so um, onerous that we're stopping um, development altogether. And I, and I'll say that. Proposing that um, uh, study, I think, was actually the key thing that made this time different than um, the previous uh, times that inclusionary zoning had been proposed. There hadn't been a lot of um, kind of background work going into those proposals. Uh, some of them were, were just basically copying and pasting from other cities, um, and and I think you know, the, the planning board um, certainly in Malden was uh, hesitant to, you know, they had a lot of concerns about just copying and pasting. And, you know, there's a lot of, I think, uh, kind of civic pride that, that people have as well that, you know, well, we don't want to be that community or that doesn't work for Malden. So I think, you know, taking the time um, to do that study and kind of ground it in, in, the reality of, of the market um, really set us up to uh, be successful this this time around, um, and and through that study, you know, and and also when we established, so we were doing these things in tandem, developing the trusts action plan, which you know I would consider was really kind of serves our purpose of of being that product housing production plan that we never did. Um, so doing the trust action plan in tandem with this inclusionary zoning feasibility study, uh, you know, we were able to do more community engagement around affordable housing in general. Um, and, you know, one of the priorities in the trust was to advocate for inclusionary zoning. Um, and, you know, and with the, the feasibility study, we did do some, you know, stakeholder uh, focus groups and trying to uh, build support for that, but also, gather as much information as we needed to make sure that the ordinance itself um, was a really strong proposal. And the, you know, the other piece of that uh, with the study was, you know, we, we put together an advisory group that included city staff, but also um, I think crucially two city councilors from opposite ends of the, the political spectrum and got them both on board um, you know, working with the consultant every, you know, month or so, uh, and really being actively involved in that. But I think, you know, overall, the, the key um, to combating the anti-housing sentiment in Malden was really focusing our messaging on affordability. I think everyone can kind of get behind uh, affordability. Um, the reality is that if we don't change some of these other um, limiting factors, namely our, our, our zoning, 
um, our inclusionary zoning isn't going to do much. So we have a lot more work ahead of us. Um, but you know, we at least I think got that um, that, that crucial kind of piece um, passed. I'll stop there. I'm sure there there will be more questions, and I can talk a little bit more um, in in a little bit. Yeah, I do have a couple questions I jotted down, but I think we really need to move to Jesse. Um, and this is sort of a final big question, which is, you know, there's been just a lot of local movement, uh, how's pro housing movement? And I'm curious if you have thoughts about, you know, what is spurring this? Um, it does feel like it's our moment. I hope it's our moment. Um, you know, you, you have certainly been, Abundant housing has certainly been, you know, really fantastic on social media about kind of encouraging baby steps, big steps, what have you. But if you could just talk a little bit about that, sort of where where is this coming from, and if, where do you think it might be going? What's different now? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, thanks, Katie. And you know, just just for the the benefit of folks who aren't familiar with abundant housing, you know, we are. Uh, a relatively young organization, a statewide coalition of uh, pro-housing, grassroots pro-housing organizations. Uh, we launched last year, sounds similar to the Revere Housing Coalition, we, we launched in the midst uh, or the early pandemic. And so, you know, so much of what we've done has been, been virtual. But, you know, our, our slogan at Abundant Housing uh, Mass is that Massachusetts is for everyone. And we really do believe that every community in Massachusetts needs to be open and welcoming uh, to er everyone, uh, regardless of race or class, age, ability, or any other life, life experience or, or circumstances. And so, so that's the mission that really drives the work that we're doing. And you know, we as an organization work, I would say in parallel, in tandem with, with Whitney and her team at the Municipal Engagement Initiative with a similar focus in helping to support um, you know, housing, affordable housing, pro-housing activists around the Commonwealth. Um, you know, with, you know, the, the specific focus uh, in our work um, on sort of general housing abundance that, you know, we need housing for people uh, of all income levels, and we need certainly to make sure that there's robust funding and support for affordable housing, but, but there is a role also for market rate housing in some communities to help, uh, you know, avoid competition between working families, working class families, and, and, and wealthier folks. And, 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 the, and, and, and the shortage of housing in Massachusetts being one of the, the primary drivers of, of gentrification and, and displacement in, in, in a lot of communities. Um, and so I think, you know, to actually answer your question, Katie, I think there's probably a variety of reasons um, why we've seen this movement grow. Um, I think to some degree it's grown in Massachusetts because of the work that, you know, we at Abundant Housing and that CHAPA as municipal engagement has been doing in investing in local activists. Um, but, you know, we've seen a real interesting emergence um, of um, sort of pro-housing, affordable housing activism, um, even in the time since the, you know, quote unquote national um, conversation or uprising, as we called it, around uh, you know since George Floyd's murder and and a lot of communities, particularly in some of the wealthier, whiter communities that identify as progressive, doing some sort of internal searching around. Well, why, if we are such a progressive community that believes that we need to be open and welcoming, you know, why are we as a community 90, 95 percent white? You know, higher median incomes with low low rates of affordable housing compared to other parts of the state, and so some of the national conversation in progressive communities around Massachusetts has driven it. And you know, it's I I think it's it's un, I'm glad that's happening. It's unfortunate that it took that incident, the murder of George Floyd, and 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 the national reckoning since then, uh, because it's a conversation we've needed to be having for a long time. But you know, if that's a silver lining out of such a national tragedy, um, that's you know that I think that's one of the drivers that we're seeing. A lot of it in places like um, Hamilton, up on the North Shore, for instance. We have a board member um, who has been uh, organizing 
with um, the Hamilton, I forget what it's called, but Hamilton Wenham uh, anti-racism uh, working group um, around housing issues and advocating for more, uh, more affordable housing and, and housing production up in those communities. Um, so I think that's a big driver. Uh, you know, also it's just the personal experience that people have. Um, I know when, when Laura spoke, she talked about her personal experience um, being displaced from Jamaica Plain and, and finding community uh, in Lynn, a community that, that, that she wanted to live in. And I think that's an important, um, it's important to share that, those, those stories. And I think that's why people are beginning um, because of the displacement and, and movement often sort of forced or, or non-chosen movement to other communities, why people are starting to have this conversation. Um, we certainly talked earlier about uh, accessory dwelling units, and in, in particular with, with Austin from AARP, the important role those can play uh, for senior citizens. And I think as senior citizens have tried to figure out how to age in place or age in community, um, the recognition that living in large, sprawling, single family homes isn't the right type of housing for them. Um, so that's a type of personal experience that I think is driving it. I think in a lot of communities, we're seeing uh, young people who may have grown up in that community, who you know maybe even are, aren't even low income, maybe they have they are professionals with college degrees, you know, working in a, a, a tech or a biotech company in Boston, finding that they're no longer able to afford uh, to buy a home in the community where they were raised, even on professional salaries, because that's the direction that home ownership is going uh, in in the state, uh, in large part because of incredibly limited supply. So, so I think people are starting to reflect on the own, their own experience, their own experience not being able to afford uh, to downsize, their own experience not being able to afford living in a community where they were raised or for their children not to be able to come afford, uh, to be able to afford to come back and live in the community where they were raised. And so the housing crisis is hitting people uh, of all income levels, uh, of all life experiences. And I think, yes, I think, Katie, I think we're in a moment. And I think it's it's a moment that's driven by crisis, but it's also a moment of opportunity. Um, and, you know, that's what we're trying to do at, at Abundant Housing is, is, you know, have something positive come out of that. And, and the positivity being homes for everyone ac across Massachusetts. So I hope that those are some reflections. I'm sure there's other reasons. I'm sure you know, anyone else in, on this panel could come up with multiple others. But, you know, when I think about it, I think those are the immediate things that are driving it, in my experience, for a lot of people um, around greater Boston and around the state. Thank you. I, I would encourage other panelists to, you know, engage in this as a conversation. But I do have a question, Jesse, for you, which yeah. is um, how are concerns about climate change weaving its way into this. Um, you know, we as housing advocates frequently hear from community members that say, well, maybe they're not even housing advocates, but that, you know, they're like, yeah, we want more housing, but it's so bad for the environment to be building housing. Um, and they're not really looking at the land use pattern issue. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of curious how that is, if that's writing itself in any way or any thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you've hit the, the nail on the head. I think there is some confusion about the interplay between you know, housing creation, building new homes, development and, and sustainability. And you know, the reality is that yes, the historic pattern of development over the last 80 years or so, and not just Massachusetts, but around the country of, of suburban sprawl is devastating to the environment and ate up massive amounts of open space, green fields and farmland um, all around the country and in, in, in suburbs and exurbs um, around major metropolitan areas. And, and that has been devastating. And also that pattern forces people into cars uh, to drive just to get basic services, to drive to their jobs. And of course, Transportation emissions are one of the major drivers of uh, greenhouse gases uh, historically and still to this day in Massachusetts and the United States. And so we need development patterns 
um, that address the the real devastating environmental consequences of you know the last century, and that is focusing on infill development near jobs, so people don't necessarily need to drive or at least drive long distances through many other communities to get to work or near services transportation of course we need to continue investing in our tra our public transportation infrastructure um which is you know also a crisis in massachusetts um but i think the point is that you know focusing new development in existing urban areas converting you know urban brownfields or industrial areas to you know multi-family housing and and mixed use style developments is actually a way to help increase the sustainability of new housing production and, 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 and overcome some of the environmental devastation of the last century. And you know, we could get into how you know, multifamily housing is actually more sustainable than single family uh, housing in terms of sharing loads, you know, heating and cooling loads and um, you know, often being placed closer to jobs and, and services, et cetera. So, those are some of the things that we try to talk about to push back on the notion that uh, housing um, development in and of itself is, is unsustainable because it's, it's not, it's just the way that we used to do it and still often do it in the sprawling manner that is environmentally destructive, destructive and has brought us to the point where we're at, so. Thank you. Um, we got a question um, from Josh McCabe, and Josh, I don't know if you want to unmute yourself, ask or 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 go ahead. If I don't hear from you in a sec, I'll just read it out. Um, anyway, Josh was asking. I think everyone touched on this, but um, if if panelists can expand on to what extent. Um, to what kind of obstacle is limited technical knowledge on the part of policymakers? So not so much the community, but the um, city council, the, the folks actually doing the zoning versus limited mobilization of support for policy changes. Um, and he's saying, I know everyone's gonna say both are really important, but I, this is a question that we all are wondering too. We often now have policymakers that don't truly understand the issue. And how do you get to that nut to kind of get that squared away? So I'd love to hear from any of you on that. I'll say real quickly and then I'll let someone else uh, speak. Um, but I think that's a great point that Josh raises. Um, and you know, it's a particular challenge that I've seen on the local level when people are elected to, and it's certainly on the state level as well, but when people are elected to you know, uh, boards of selectmen or city councils, boards of aldermen, local legislative bodies, often it's their first foray into to politics or policy. Um, and so they lack a lot of the knowledge. Um, and, and absolutely, to Josh's point, that needs to be a focus at abundant housing. You know, we often work closely with Housing Forward Massachusetts, which is another organization that was started recently that's headed by former Boston City Councilor Josh Zakum. And one of their focuses at Housing Forward, while we're focused on the grassroots and supporting the activists, is to provide help provide policy education and guidance to elected um, officials and municipal officials to help them understand these housing challenges from a data-driven perspective, not from um, just a, a, a perception, the perception that new housing is bad. Uh, so yeah, thanks Whitney for sharing that link uh, to Housing Forward. So I'll leave it at that and let someone else jump in. Anyone else want to chime in on the, you know, the, the bringing up local officials, et cetera? Whitney? Yeah, I think that um, to Josh's question, right? I think he anticipated uh, the response in terms of the balance there, right? Because certainly as you begin to mobilize, um, you know, residents around an issue who are advocating and, and asking for their municipal officials to support um, said policy legislation, et cetera, it, it certainly um, is the catalyst oftentimes for folks to sort of lean in right on the other end, right, for policymakers. And so utilizing that as an opportunity to educate, 
right, um, to educate around uh, around those things, I think is an intricate uh, balance we can often find and certainly is part of the model in which we try to bring to our coalition building, right? So as much as we're bringing together stakeholders who are residents, who see themselves as advocates, who are certainly stakeholders in the community, part of um, our meetings are oftentimes are, are attended by municipal officials as well. So sort of being able to build that model around building the relationships, building trust is certainly a huge part of the coalition building model. And so there's able to be some level of dialogue there, right? And so where, where we can play roles um, at CHAPA and facilitating that process, but also giving and sharing information, we certainly strive to do. But certainly as more folks are sort of supporting an effort, it certainly gives uh, gives catalyst to uh, folks leaning in to making sure that they're, um, they're vested as well as, as sort of uh, versed on the various policies. And so it certainly is an intricate balance and, and it's something that we strive to, um, to do in our work sort of before the issue comes up, right? So that we're building those relationships, um, which is why we call it the municipal engagement initiative as opposed to certain, just exclusively community engagement. Like we're mm. trying to engage the community specifically with municipal government. Um, and so that, you know, those things can be fostered and, um, and seen to fruition. Thank you. Um, we, if anyone else wants to chime in, Christine, um, want to go ahead, Christine, with your question? Thanks, Katie. I don't have a question. I just wanted to chime in on, you know, this choosing between educating elected officials or mobilizing community members. I think the elected officials, when they become more educated on a certain issue, especially around affordable housing, they themselves can mobilize their coalitions and constituents to be. So I think there's a lot of overlap that can happen over there. Um, and I think we've seen a, a lot of elected officials coming to their positions, not knowing anything about climate change or uh, housing that you know once they get more educated, they come out and publicly support these issues. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to overlap there. Thank you. Um, and then we had another question actually for Evan um, at, about, you know, it's a minor detail, but what was the cost of the feasibility assessment for inclusionary zoning? And also how did you get support to get money? I mean, typically these initiatives often there is a something that costs money. So you'd have to get, you know, your city officials to pay for that. But what was the cost and how important do you think that was in terms of getting this done and driving it home, getting inclusionary zoning passed? Yeah, I, I really appreciate this question, um, getting down into the, the nitty gritty of it. Um, you know, when we, we first started talking about our, our we, they were our affordable housing strategies, which are, you know, uh, proposal, you know, to deal with what we found out in the HNA back in 2019. So that was affordable housing trust fund and inclusionary zone. So the first thing, you know, we've got the council on board with was this, this study. Um, the study itself, uh, I believe cost uh, about, it was $20,000. And we, we paid that um, through a contribution from, so my office used to be uh, the Malden Redevelopment Authority. We were a, a separate agency, but back in July, we were absorbed into the city. So now we're the Office of Strategic Planning and Community Development. But back then we were a separate agency. So we put in uh, a portion of it, the housing authority put in a portion of it, and then the city covered the rest. Um, and that's, you know, that's how we, we paid for it. But we all, we got everyone on board to uh, acknowledge that this is, this is the way that we, had to do it. And I think this also answers the, the previous question a little bit um, of, of kind of educating the, the elected officials or, or providing some more kind of data-driven um, uh, analysis. Because I, I do think this, this was the crucial piece in, in passing it. You know, I, I think there was already a lot of support publicly and among elected officials for inclusionary zoning 
in general, um, but the devil's in the details. So doing this study, we were able to, to prove that it was, you know, the, the best way um, or the best kind of solution for Malden, uh, the way that, that we presented it um, and have those conversations about, you know, we, we want to design something that fits for Malden, uh, both from, you know, a market standpoint and meeting the goals of the city. Uh, and I think through that, um, we were able to show that we could be pretty aggressive with our inclusionary zoning ordinance. So our, our ordinance requires 15% of, of units um, affordable at 50% AMI if it's rental and 80% AMI if it's home ownership. And there's, there's a couple other kind of uh, curiosities in there uh, as well, but I'll, I'll <laughs> keep that. But I, th I think, you know, doing that study really helped us make the argument that we could be aggressive um, and that was the appropriate thing to do to meet the needs of the Malden community. Thank you. And you got a thanks from Chris who asked the question. Um, but I think we're at about time. So if I don't see any more questions, I wanted to just thank this panel. This was such a rich group of discussions and I, you know, I could listen to you all day. So thank you for that. Um, Whitney, Lore, Jesse, Evan, you all did a fantastic job. And I'm gonna turn to Christine to sort of close out the whole event, if that's okay, Christine. Um, sure. sure, thank you, Katie, for moderating today's webinar. Uh, so really grateful for all the attendees that came out, not just today, but throughout the three days that we had this webinar series. And if you sign up for any of the three sessions, you will be getting a recap with all the materials and recording of the event itself. And again, please feel free to reach out any reach out to any of the team members at MHP on community assistance and any of the panelists that you saw today. Their contact information will also be available in the email. And again, just thanks to everyone for coming out. And we're always here if you need additional insight or support. And have a great rest of the afternoon and the week. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everybody.